starting with. Hi to everyone joining us on Facebook. My name is Carter Banker. Um, I'm a second year MALD here at the Fletcher School. MALD stands for Masters of Arts in Law and Diplomacy, for those who don't know. Um, I'm specializing in international security and human security and about to graduate. Um, and I'm here with um, a mentor of mine, Farah Pandith, who um, is um, one of the preeminent experts on countering violent extremism, also known as CVE. Um, and she also went to Fletcher. Um, so I think before we get started, I'll just give a little bit more sure. of your background. I think that would be helpful for people watching. Um, so you um, were a political appointee under both uh, Bush presidents, um, and more recently you were the first ever special representative to Muslim communities for the State Department under the Obama administration. Um, and currently you are a senior adjunct fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and you've just written a new book called How We Win. Yes. Um, which is, you can pre-order right now on Amazon. Thank you. So, a little <laughs> plug, um, where you outline um, sort of a lot of your career and a lot of your findings um, from all of your work in yes. the field of CVE. Um, so, yeah, I guess, and, and also I should add that you are about to get an honorary degree from Tufts University, so congratulations. Very much so. Thank you. I'm really honored. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so, I think we'll start out this conversation um, I'd love to sort of hear, since you are not only sort of one of the premier experts in CBE, you were a pioneer in the field. You were one of the people that developed it as a field. So how do you think that it's evolved over the course of your career? Carter, first of all, I'm really happy to be sitting here with you uh, in the spring of uh, 2018 as you are about to graduate. I'm yes. so proud of you. Thank and you. Uh, you've done an exceptional job in the work that you've done. And I want to say, uh, your extraordinary research uh, in helping me with my book has been really important for, yes. for the, the value of um, my book and, and going directions that I hadn't always thought about. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm also really delighted to be back on Fletcher's campus where everybody is studying for exams. So yes. I, I know it's a, it's yeah. a moment where you had to take away um, to, to be with me today. So thanks for that. Uh, CVE, uh, the Countering Violent Extremism field, was developed in the Bush administration, and it was really embodied in the 2006 National Security Strategy, where President Bush described the war as a battle of arms and a battle of ideas. And the battle of ideas is what we call soft power. Mm -hmm. It's how we can make sure that we influence the ideas uh, in, a, in a direction that overpowers the ideas of the extremists. So this isn't law enforcement. This isn't about uh, watching different particular communities. This is about making sure that we are protecting youth from how extremists go out to prey on them. And as, as you know, this field, when it began, was piloted uh, first in Europe to sort of see how do we do this. And it was all about what's happening at the grassroots, making sure that we're listening to Muslim communities uh, in, in a very deep way understanding that the kinds of extremism aren't just the, the terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but in fact, uh, CVE also embodies uh, the ideological us versus them narrative that empowers groups like neo-Nazis. So this, the, the field is broad, it isn't one kind of extremism, but what's similar across the bank is that uh, everything is pivoted on this us versus them, everything is pivoted on the idea of the other. Uh, so, it's changed dramatically. It's changed dramatically because, one, the interagency, or all of the players in the Washington area, have now uh, taken on the issue of CVE in their own way. When it first started, it was really sort of looked at like, you know, I, the ideological piece is something that perhaps the Department of State or the Department of Homeland Security could work on. Now we're seeing more of an integration. Having said that, um, even though there is an international awareness about youth protection, and whether you call it prevent, or whether you call it at CVE, or whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. Stop kids from going down a path that would reach a place where they could be recruited. This field has, has not uh, changed in one very specific way. We're still only doing a little bit of work in it. And when I see that 18 years, 17 years since 9-11 ha has happened, you would have imagined that we would have seen a scale up with resources, a scale mm -hmm. up with innovation, and a scale up with personnel. Yeah, and we just 
happen. But you know, Carter, you have been working on CBE yourself, and I think it's really important. I mean, as you look at this field, you know, what has inspired you? How have you seen what you have done uh, on the ground? And I know you're you're very specifically. Um, doing a lot of deep research in Indonesia, which I will say is a really important piece of this. One of the problems with the way the interagency has looked at this issue is we've been very uh, focused on a particular region of the world where, for example, uh, ISIS is doing most of its destruction in the Middle East. But you and I both know uh, people are getting radical radicalized all over the world. How, how have you seen uh, this play out? Yeah, so I think for me in Indonesia, it's it's been a really interesting um, sort of case study because you're not only seeing, I, I've found that I'm not only interested in sort of the violent extremism that goes on there, but there's there's also radicalization mm -hmm. in other ways that are ca that's causing huge problems for social cohesion. So even if it's not, people aren't necessarily turning violent, they're, yeah, they're, they're creating problems within their communities. And so um, I'm actually writing my thesis um, on Salafism for, and for those who don't know what Salafism is, it's um, a con very conservative form of Islam that came out of Saudi Arabia and has been spread to many countries throughout the world. Um, so I'm looking at how Salafism has spread in Indonesia and what social cohesion problems have resulted and what kinds of conflicts. Um, and I mean, for me, I had, you were earlier talking about this idea of um, the us versus them narrative. Yeah. And I think I saw that it really apparently in some of my field research, I was lucky enough through Fletcher, I was able to get some funding to go do field research for this um, back in January. So I was there and I was interviewing Salafi women in particular because I had, as a woman, I had special access yes. to them. Um, and I remember having this conversation with um, this one Salafi woman in particular. And at the end of the conversation, she said to me, I'm so glad that you invited me here and that I decided to come because I didn't know that there were people like you in America, in the West. Um, you've totally changed my mind yes. about what Americans are. And to me, that was really eye-opening because I think that a lot of times Westerners and Americans in particular forget that when we show up in a country, especially one that maybe doesn't get as many American visitors, that we really are representing America to them. And so this woman, I realized, had never met an American or Westerner. And so even if I'm not completely changing her mind about what what Americans, what the West is, I'm planting this seed of, okay, th maybe a lot of the things that you've heard aren't universally true. Um, and so I found that to be really powerful and then it sort of worked on the flip side too. I call it kind of one-on-one -on -one diplomacy because I feel like we both really impacted each other. Yes. Um, because I think I went into it, I try to go into all these conversations being very open-minded, but at the same time knowing that I am going to disagree with these women on a lot of yeah. fundamental <laughs> issues. I have a lot of other Indonesians disagree with them on a lot of fundamental issues, which is why there's these social cohesion problems. Um, and I think for me, it was especially sometimes their view of the role of, of women in society, where I knew and was confirmed that, that we would differ. But then you, we'd start talking and you'd find all of these things that we had in common and we'd just have these moments where we really bonded. And then I realized, I don't know, I had this same realization that I was sort of had these assumptions about people um, that were being proven wrong. And I guess, I don't know, to me, all of what all of this sort of demonstrates is just the power of, yeah, of this one-on-one -on -one diplomacy in an age, we're, we're living in this age of disinformation, which right. is this huge problem. We talk about narratives and counter-narratives all the time, um, and it's so hard to combat those because in the age of social media, everyone's living in their own little self-reinforcing bubble, um, and information whether it be true or false, spreads faster than we can keep up with it. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know, that, that for me has been sort of, that was a really um, key takeaway for me from my, from my field research. Well, that's a really important takeaway, and it's the essence of what diplomacy is, isn't it? It's people-to-people -people, mm -hmm. um, interaction. And, and I think breaking down uh, stereotypes and narratives um, happen in a lot of different ways, and the field of diplomacy is very rich with opportunity. 
Um, and whether you do cultural exchanges and whether you do sports diplomacy, whether you do, um, you do this kind of breaking down perceptions in, a, in, in ways that, um, that allow people to see the other side, um, we know that it actually can make a difference. And the problem that we're seeing in the world today is we're looking at this very particular effort that the extremists are, are embarking on is that with the walls um, going up really fast, people in their own little, as you said, bubble or a rabbit hole, whatever you want to call it, um, were unable to see the other side. And the other opinions about uh, religious doctrine or about how to be a specific kind of person uh, doesn't doesn't break through because the walls are so high um, because that's all they're seeing that's all they're they're able to see and I think one of the things that's very important for your generation especially uh, those of those of you who are graduating from the Fletcher School in a couple of weeks um, it is critical that these kinds of experiences that you had with your field research that you were able to do because of Fletcher I had the same exact experience when I was uh, a Fletcher as uh, you know after my first year of Fletcher I did field research in, in northern India um, which started me down a path of understanding extremism these kinds of uh, in-person examples um, will help and shape you as you think about this issue in, in, a, in around the world now and in and, and years to come so I'm really happy you saw that and and saw it firsthand yeah thank you yeah it was no and I mean it reminded me of a lot of experiences that I read about in your book too and thank I you. yeah I sort of I yeah I recognized a lot of that um, I'm wondering if so I mean even though I think we're seeing things going in a positive direction in CVE, sort of, as you were describing, sort of over the course of, of your career, things have gotten uh, more promising, but we're still facing, I think it's still pretty daunting, and we're talking about this idea of one-on-one -on -one diplomacy, and you've engaged in a lot of that, um, just through, uh, especially I think when you were working for the Obama administration and visiting um, many different countries and meeting with Muslim youth. Um, and just talking to them one-on-one, -on -one. and that's a super effective way to to spread understanding, but that, how do you scale that? And how do you, it seems to me like, even though it's effective, it, yeah, it just doesn't seem like a, a whole scale solution. It isn't the solution. One person is not the solution, but many people together are the solution, and mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be um, Pollyanna going out there saying, if we skip along and all become friends, everything will be great. Um, there are evil actors in this world, and they are financed and they have momentum and they have a, a methodology that allows them to build their armies of recruits. In order to puncture their ability to do that, we have to have more one-on-one um, -on -one interactions through former extremists who are interacting and scaling up the programs that we know. When we began the, the you know, countering violent extremism in 2006 and 2007, 2008, we were just experimenting on what might work. In the years that have passed through that time, we have seen academics do a great deal of research about how people get recruited, um, what their techniques are, why on the behavioral side they find this ideology appealing. They've, there's a lot of study around identity and belonging, which is the bottom line for these kids and how they get how they get moved in a particular way. Um, and we've seen all kinds of nonprofit organizations in our country, in, in every other part of the world, um, try different things with their community, what we know is that in order to be able to protect youth, it has to come from a localized, grassroots opportunity with authentic, credible actors that are able to push back. Now, in, in all these years since 9-11, we've experimented, we've tried to see what we, need to, what we need to do. It is not one person going from country to country building bridges, which is great and, and important, but it is scaling the dozens upon dozens of proven, promising, uh, uh, piloted programs uh, at scale to compete at the pace that we need to have happen. And that's what the failure has been. It's not that we don't have the ideas. It is not that we don't have the pilots. It is we haven't gone all in. And from the United States government point of view, we've spent 0.013% of our budget that we're fighting ISIS on soft power. That is pathetic. Um, so how do you expect to stop recruitment? Just, just using America, let's not talk about any of the other countries out there. And for those who are watching us today, you know, you're not just here in the United States, you're all over the world. Ask yourself how much money your country is spending on soft power um, uh, uh, on this particular um, issue. And you will find it, it pennies on the dollar. You know, and so when I see the opportunity that we have ahead of us, uh, it is really understanding how to scale. 
um, not just with the professionals that are in the field doing this work. Um, it's not with the person who has the highest you know, title and the, and the greatest scope and the access to the president. It's not just that. It is NGOs that are given the kind of resources and support that they need to do the work that they need to do. Government is the greatest strength of government, ours or anybody else's, is to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we hear on the ground. And we have, we have a great deal to do to be able to scale uh, at the level we need to do. And, the, and the, the scary part, Carter, is that for the kind of extremism that I work on, um, we are looking at terrorist organizations that look at one type of person right now. Those are people who are connected in some way to, um, whether it's through heritage or through belief or through culture, to an Islamic culture. So they use Islam for their nefarious ends. And if you look at that, they're preying upon Muslim youth. They're not preying on Hindus or Christians or Jews or Buddhists or anybody in between. They're looking at the Muslim demographic. And what is the number there? They're looking at young Muslims under the age of 30. That is a billion people strong. So the problem isn't going away. The groups are gaining momentum. And we have to scale to keep up with that threat. So do you have, I mean, those are pretty daunting numbers. Do you sort of, what keeps you motivated and positive um, sort of going forward? knowing that we spend such a tiny, tiny fraction of our budget and that those are the kinds of numbers that we're dealing with. The solution is in government. The solution is outside of government. And in the years since leaving government 2014, uh, I've been very closely connected to you know, Fletcher and other great schools who are doing um, work around creating innovation with their own students and understanding the field of CBE. And I know, because you see this happening in our country and in Europe and uh, in Asia, the kinds of um, laboratories that are out there to ask young people to think differently about how to put their interest in this issue uh, to, to, to bear. How do you push forward on new aspects to this? How do you scale? How do you take the content that former extremists can give you and provide it uh, in a way that can, can showcase uh, why this kind of extremism is, is bad? How do you take mental health experts uh, and have them who are uh, who understand the human adolescent child brain um, to be able to help us understand this issue? How do you take cultural explorers and move their knowledge into this? I'm seeing a lot of different actors across the spectrum in our country and around the world of your generation who are interested in doing this, and that's where I see the promise. It isn't if we wait for people of my generation or if we wait for the United States government to be the lead on this, we're gonna be waiting for a long time. I see the promise in those outside of government who know how to build movements, who know how to activate without anybody else's help, um, really trying to do more than they've ever done to help their peers from finding this ideology appealing. Great. Well, Farah, thank you so much for taking it's the time to pleasure. talk to me today. Thanks. It's it's always great to see you here on campus. Thanks, and good luck with your amazing new program that you're starting in Indonesia as a born fellow. I'm oh, really, really you. excited. And thank you. I think you're going to come back from that experience um, with a lot of knowledge that you're going to you're going to help me understand what's happening in Indonesia in a better way. I hope so. Yeah, that's the plan. Congratulations. Thanks again. Thanks.